Welcome to Films in the Wilderness, a six-week limited podcast series during Lent 2021, brought to you by the Diocese of Southern Ohio. I'm Carl Stevens. I'm Jed Deering. And with us today, we have a very special guest, creator and storyteller, Elisa Leahy. And Elisa, I was hoping you might be able to share with us a little bit just about your uh, relationship to film, uh, what's drawn you to appreciating that uh, as an art form, and maybe any way that it's also connected with you in your spiritual life. Sure. Um, so for me, I was I was raised with a view of life that's very action oriented, very um, I would say justice oriented in a way as well. So um, the first time I really discovered the power of film, it was a way to pause the action that just kind of engulfed everything in my life um, and, and sort of step back and look at things from a strange kind of mixture of stepping back and, and jumping close in. I think film has a really great way of both allowing you to look at things from a um, broader point of view while also showing some really intimate moments. And it's something that you can miss if you're just caught up in doing all the time, which um, is easy for me to get sucked into. So the, the visuals for me are the, the most striking aspect of film. And when I first discovered the power of film, it was definitely through the visuals and through that uh, kind of the way that the screen can force you to stop and look at something that you may not see otherwise. So that's that's what drew me into it. And then I moved into documentary filmmaking, which kind of, I think, combines the those two aspects of my life, the very action-oriented, people-oriented part uh, of me, along with that more introspective, more philosophical uh, ability to kind of look at the broader picture. And so film and documentary film in particular for me is, is just a really powerful way of telling story and of exploring ideas and, and people. Um, and all of that, I think, connects to my faith as well, and uh, just the way that I see the world. Seems like a, a good film, given that background, right? A film about slowing down, about letting the sensory input go, or escaping, deliberately trying to escape action. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Leave No Trace, for sure. It allows for that in a way that's um, not always seen in narrative film, especially mainstream narrative film. It's got a very documentary feel to it, which um, allows a lot of that kind of, that slowness and that just kind of sinking into the moment. And that is the movie that we will be covering this week, 2018's Leave No Trace from director Deborah Granick. Uh, it stars as two most notable names are uh, Ben Foster as Will, a father uh, who is struggling with PTSD. His story sort of begins to slowly unfold for us over the film. And he's raising his 13-year-old daughter, Tom, uh, played by Thomas and McKenzie. And they are essentially living off the land, a subsistence style living um, in a forest, uh, out deep in the forest outside of Portland, Oregon. Uh, when we pick up with their story and they have a, a simple again uh kind of bordering on edenic life like it's it's really it's a paradise in a way um that they've made their own and yet a difficult one that we see if they've learned how to navigate day in and day out they uh seek to stay away from the city uh for reasons that begin to unfold before us that again have to do with will the father's experience uh, and his need to be separate or apart from uh, when a group of hikers or, or stumble upon them and notice them in the, the forest where it's illegal to live. Eventually, the police come in and disrupt their life. And the movie after that point is kind of the unfolding of their story, looking for home, uh, running for home, escaping to the wilderness uh, and the daughter and her father trying to navigate what it is each of them need to make a home. Uh, and to to make a life together. Uh, it's a movie that is uh, not heavy on plot or dialogue uh, for, for, again, like Elisa said, for a mainstream film and also uh, features in several cases non-professional actors, which is a, uh, a tactic that the director Deborah Granick uses throughout, especially in a final scene where we kind of stumble on a uh, a camp, sort of a side of a mountain where a number of people have gathered together to live. 
And so, so that is uh, the movie that we'll be talking through today, Leave No Trace. Carl or Elisa, is there anything else in terms of general plot or, or points of the movie that would be good to mention uh, just to help people understand where we're coming from if for some reason they haven't seen the movie yet? I think one of the um, key aspects, and I, I'm sorry, you may have mentioned this, but I just want to address it again, is the the fact that her father is a vet who's suffering from PTSD, and that's a really key component of the film, I would say, and and how people deal with trauma. And I, I think the other key aspect is it's really a relationship movie. It's about the relationship of of tom and her father and her it's also a coming of age movie in a way because she has to figure out who she is in relation to um i don't want to say the civilized world because i'm not sure that the the world that we inhabit of buildings and computers and helicopters is that any more civilized than the world that um, her father is trying to constantly run to which is a, a world of simplicity and being in nature and and the peace that can be given to the mind by being in nature. But she has to figure out how much she needs community, how much she needs other people besides her father in her life and what that need is going to do to this really core relationship with her dad. And that, so it's really her story. I would say, I think he is, you know, important to the story but it's not his story. It's her story. Her trying to figure out what her life will be. So, okay. So Jed, thanks for that description of the movie. Um, do you want to read the gospel so that we can also have that in our minds as we go on? Sounds good. Yeah. The, the gospel for the first Sunday of Lent is from the gospel of Mark chapters one, verses nine through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when we were talking about the movies in the series and how we would set them up um, to go with the, the readings and the gospel I think, Jed, you did most of the work behind this, picking the film, thinking through the themes and the Gospels. What what about this Gospel led you to uh, Leave No Trace as a film that would match it? Yeah, I think it was actually one line very specifically in it, which was uh, after Jesus has been driven by the Spirit, has just descended on him out into the wilderness, and um, he was there tempted by Satan, was with the wild beast, and the line... And the angels waited on him. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was really, I was really struck by this because so often we don't have angels within the scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures or in the Christian New Testament, uh, attending to people. They're, they come as messengers. And so something is marking out, uh, something is marking out the relationship between the angelic and Jesus here in this story. Um, but it got me thinking about Leave No Trace when thinking of wilderness films and the way in that movie that there are, in my mind, really angels that are attending to this family, uh, to Will and Tom throughout. Um, and at the same time, it is not a movie that is naive about evil in the world. <laughs> it is not a film that uh, forgets that there are reasons for people to be on the run. Um, that can harm all that can cause harm to people uh, and so uh, there was something to me about something to me about that in the film after the the police and the rangers come and raid will and tom's camp and take them away we see a social worker who attends like especially 
to the fact that this family wants to stay together, uh, tends well to the fact that there are educational and social needs this daughter has and works to help them find a place in a rural space to live. You can tell is being very intentional about trying to watch out for both of them to the best that she can provide within the state guidelines, their needs. You know, you have even the person who provides their housing in exchange for some work talk about how he was sympathetic to Will's desire to live off in the woods. You have a truck driver they encounter later who names the evil and asks uh, Tom to come near to make sure that she's not being taken by this older man, that she's in a safe place. Everyone is consistently checking in Mm -hmm. uh, and yet consistently offering care and support and to the best they can helping this family along the way as they're in this wilderness between homes after their home is disrupted. Uh, And so that idea of uh, angels attending to Jesus, that ideal then this film that uh, I think is really generous and compassionate in its view of humanity and sees that there really can be angels that attend to those who are wayward or lost on their way. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I I love that connection and I hadn't thought of that. um, But as soon as you said that phrase, (laughs) the angels attending, I, my mind immediately went to that final community, and this is probably a bit of a spoiler. I'm sure we're going to have several of those in this conversation, but that the community that they find themselves in, the one that Tom chooses to stay at. Um, and it's it's interesting because you're right, there are all these different moments where folks are checking in and and offering something, but at the same time, there are, I mean, for example, that first home that they stay at, there there are these strings attached. There are these, these moments where you glimpse that, that these aren't all fully just um, giving people who don't desire anything for themselves. I mean, this man who says, you, you know, we were so impressed or inspired or whatever you, word he uses by your way of life. And so many people want to do that. And there's this hunger, there's this like we want something from you and you're, you're this oddity that we want to watch and, and observe and, you know, kind of glean something from. Um, and there's a mistrust there as well. There's this, uh, no, you can't, I don't want you around my expensive animals and the stables yet. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure where I stand with you yet. There's this holding back. Um, and that's, it just feels like such a good picture of society. We, we're all broken people. We're all coming at things from our own place but to fully embrace someone the way that the final community does for them is just a really beautiful thing and that that phrase of angels waiting on them that really was evocative of that community that they find in the mountains Um, and that's such a rarity (laughs) I think uh, to find a community that really is that beautiful and open and one of the things I loved about it was what a humble community it is. The beauty that the the film is able to show and that those scenes of that space um, is really wonderful because it's a kind of place that you wouldn't think of as beautiful. It's a trailer park in the mountains. These aren't people who have a lot, but they are so rich. They're so rich in in grace and it's it's a beautiful thing. Um, So yeah, I love that. Angels waiting is is really a beautiful picture. I also... um, drawing the connection between this and and the story of Jesus in the wilderness makes me think of a few different things. It's so much about the relationship of, of them, but also the relationship of humanity with nature. And you see that from the very opening shots of this movie, it, it cuts between these very wide shots, wide angles that show these gorgeous trees and all of this lush greenery. And then it will jump into these close-up shots that show you a spider on a web glistening in the light that comes through the forest leaves. And those those two things are such a part of our life, that close-up and that pulled back look. Um, And the film actually ends with very similar shots, combinations of this very intimate close-up look and this pulled back sort of broader view of things, which feels just like that's kind of encompassing everything that this film is trying to do. It's trying to show our relationship with society as a whole, but also these really close intimate relationships. That, you know, I've been wondering about that last spider web image. The the last um, shot of nature we get is a spider web and it is, and 
audience, we are thoroughly spoiling every movie we talk about during the series. So if because we can't really talk about them fully uh, without doing so. So we highly recommend you go and watch the movies first. Um, But that shot of the spider web comes right after uh, Tom and and her dad have parted ways. And um, there's so many things there that I'm, I'm not I don't entirely understand and yet they really work. And I've been trying to like puzzle out why that is, you know, but cause she comes back from this very emotional scene. Like I was watching it with my daughter and like, was like choking up and she was like giving me these 18 year old glances of like, Oh, you silly softy. What are you doing? You know, <laughs> but I was like, Oh, she's about to leave for college. You know, like, of course I'm going to get choked up about a, a daughter and a father parting ways. But um, Tom comes back to the to the trailer camp and this rescue dog which another vet has given basically loaned out to them to help her dad is waiting for her and she she bends down she scratches his ear and she's i can't remember the exact line um but it's something like he had to go you know so and she says that to the dog and so i'm thinking well it's a rescue dog right and in a way hasn't Tom kind of been his rescue dog? I mean, which is not a diminishment of her at all, but he has more or less treated her as a person who can regulate his emotions, who can keep him in check. Um, and, and so she is meeting this dog who is, they've, they've fulfilled the same function in this man's fairly broken life. And then we go to a spider web as a next shot. And I thought, well, is, is the director saying that she was, a little caught in the web of this and and maybe now she's getting free particularly because i didn't uh at least i didn't really notice that spider web at the beginning of the film but you know that's it's quite a callback right (laughs) so is a use there to say she's now found this freedom if so is a web is a very strange image to use for that because usually we think of webs as catching us or capturing us in some way or connecting us or connect right right that's true that's very yeah very good like she's found a new connection maybe it's what it's meant to say um the other thing i wanted to say about that community is all along jed i think you're totally right like everybody is somewhat angelic you know that trucker is fairly angelic the social workers you can't really fault anyone um there's that great scene where they go to church and there's like there's like the the dance i cringed that whole scene (laughs) there's like a dance troupe like a a liturgical dance troupe and they're all older (laughs) white women with these scarves and you're watching it and it's hard to be like oh that's you know not to think that's slightly ridiculous like it does look slightly ridiculous and yet after the service like one of the older women is showing tom the scarf and how to use it. And there's a kind of gentleness and an invitation. And through Tom's eyes, like this is all new. Nothing is ridiculous. Cause it's all like, oh, this is how people operate when they're not living in a tent in the woods, right? <laughs> and she's kind of fascinated and excited by everything in a way. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that every one of these angels, to use your term, Judd, that she encounters or that they encounter until they get to that that trailer camp um i think the real question on all these people's hearts are can we get this father and daughter to fit in can we normalize them to what we understand uh human life should be and you know what do we have to do to make that happen are there papers they can sign where they kind of contractually agree to to be quote unquote normal you know or uh, what can we do to make them fit into society and when they get to that trailer camp, Tom at a certain point says to her dad, these people are not that different from us, right? So they found the other people who are not going to accept a kind of social contract and be forced to live in a certain way. They found other people who are living to will, want to live within a different covenant or contract. And yet still with each other, which is right. different. That, you know, they they are certainly separate from, you know, uh, popular society popular culture in a way with where they're living like Lisa was saying up on the mountainside in this trailer park in this place up away in the woods and yet there's a record they recognize that they're still in need for others 
and these are others who've landed there similarly. And I think about the the scene with the beehive, yeah. right? And there's a sense of they've learned to trust. There's a certain warmth. Like in a lot of Christian art, uh, bees are used to symbolize like a pious and a unified community. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see like even that, that idea of there is this unified community. They have this way of life they've committed to, uh, even as they're all maybe a little bit on the outside of society as a whole. And I think in that, in that you find uh, that that's where the spirit of Tom is different than her father, is that she, while she doesn't long for all the trappings of normal life, <laughs> she does have a longing for community. She does have a need to be nurtured and cared for with others. Um, and, and so you see that speak to her and call her. Yeah. There was an interesting tension that I kept on coming back to throughout this film between um, kind of two different, <laughs> very similar stories I was seeing. One being this, this journey to, um, this journey towards individual freedom, this, this you know, striving to be, to be free and to make your own choices, regardless of what these, you know, this regulation that where we live, the structure that we live under puts on our lives. And that kind of, that longing for, for independence that feels so very American, right? Um, and then at the same time, seeing this family journeying, uh, trying to escape trauma, trying to escape um, lack of resources, but really the trauma, I think, is the key thing that they are trying to get away from and trying to heal from and and trying to stay together. That that incredible danger that they could be separated, that's kind of what's just at their heels throughout this entire film. And those two stories to me are so interesting because you have this incredibly American idea of independence and freedom. And then you have this immigrant journey really this this journey of families that are being threatened with separation who are trying to find a safe space to live together and watching those two stories <laughs> take place and it's it's interesting because this film is not i mean everyone in this film is i believe is white this is a very white yeah. you know cast and it's a story that doesn't doesn't address issues of race in any way it doesn't bring this up and yet you see these people living on the margins of society. And um, for me, having, you know, I'm, I'm an immigration activist. I'm very involved with the immigrant community. I'm a Peruvian American. And I see their story and it just, it, it feels so familiar. It's the stories I've heard of people who have gone through so much and just fought against these structures and these regulations that are trying to separate them, that are not allowing them to heal, that are not allowing them to find safe shelter. Um, and yeah, I just, I see this family who want what everyone wants, who wants freedom and healing and togetherness. And it feels very much like an immigrant journey. Even to the extent where he is traveling with um, important papers, right? And there's a there's a worry about what's going to happen with the papers. And it's not like people are really wanting them to show the papers, you know, like they're never like stopped and asked to, to show their papers. But it, there's a sense in which their personal story or particularly his personal story is held within those papers. And if they were lost, her chance of understanding him in a way is lost because, you know, there's a... So there's a moment when he goes into town. They they've been um, they've been traveling north into Washington State, and they go through the winter woods. It's a higher altitude; it's colder, and are in real danger of freezing to death. And then they find this cabin, this abandoned cabin, which they break into. Um, and there's a certain point where he goes to go to town, wherever town might be, to get some groceries. And she is left alone and she opens the papers and, and finds a newspaper article that he's been carrying with him this entire time about his battalion that he served with and about the, particularly the, the suicide rate, the number of veterans from that battalion who have killed themselves. And it's, it's powerful in a way because it helps you understand that for him, this choice for this, you know, very countercultural lifestyle is a choice against suicide, right? Like that is his alternative 
in his in his mind. Um, so he is acting to save his life, much like I think immigrants and refugees who are fleeing incredibly hard situations are acting to save their lives. You know, like nobody nobody really does this unless it's it's life and death for them. Um, but did you guys think that in that moment, like that was the first time she had seen that article or did she already know this about him? I, I think it was very, it, I don't think she'd seen the article that seemed like a key moment for her. And you saw, I mean, the fear and the tension just skyrocketed after that. And that's when she started to, um, you know, she started to light candles so that he would find his way home. And she started to you see her looking out into the wilderness and wondering, and you, you can just hear her thoughts, <laughs> wondering um, if he will come back. And if he doesn't come back, is it because of a choice he made? That that fear, I mean, you feel that with her in a way that I don't think she would have maybe felt so specifically before seeing that article. Yeah, I think that combined with the fact that she also found part of the test at that same time that he had taken that really clinical test in the, the room with fluorescent lights of answering yes, no, to try to identify, you know, where his psychological state was. And so she's reading that as well. And that's those results are sinking in along with this newspaper article. And, and I think you do see when we get to the when we get to the next stop and we end up in this community in the woods. Uh, I think that that moment plays deep into her desire to stay there yeah. too, right? Of to recognize that maybe I think there's a part where she recognizes that, you know, without others, maybe she's not safe or maybe she will be, could be left alone. I think it starts to come into focus. Yeah. Speaking of, of parallel scenes, there's a, there's that scene when they're at the Christmas farm and she has just kind of wandered down the road. She's met this nice blonde haired boy who's building a, a small house for him. Um, what are those called? Small house, right? Tiny house. Tiny house. Tiny house, yeah. For himself and is in 4-H. And she goes to this 4-H meeting where she's with other kids her own age. Um, and he is left in the house and he goes outside the house and he just calls her name, um, you know, shouting for her to come back because he doesn't know where she is. And it is as if he recognizes that she's in danger and being lost to this society surrounding them. And yet when, when after they've gone to Washington state and are in that, and she's alone in that cabin in the woods and lighting candles, she shouts his name into the wilderness as if she recognizes that he's in danger and being totally lost to the wilderness. And it's, it's as if they are balanced between these two extremes, right? Like, either culture or either the wilderness and they're just in this liminal space all through. And then the tragedy of the ending is that they recognize that they cannot stay in that liminal space and that they can't go into the world that the other one wants to inhabit. He wants to just go disappear into the mountains. She wants to stay in the, in the trailer camp. Yes. And that's, I think that um, one of the most interesting things to me about the way this story is told is that it's a story that I have seen many times that has been told many times, but it was told so differently. And that's that's the story of, it is a coming of age story, but it's a story also about identity and how identity changes and how our identities and our parents and our family's identities are not always the same and where that separation occurs. And Typically, I mean, I've seen this story in immigrant communities again and again. I've seen this in real life, but also in just beautiful stories and books and films where you see, you know, the, the next generation of kids growing up in a new country, in a new culture, finding their own way and, and finding a way to integrate into that society. And it's something that the parents may never understand and fully even accept sometimes and and that is again a very immigrant story but you rarely see it like this you rarely see this told in a way that's you know it's not about race or ethnicity or uh, you know culture it's it's about experience and trauma and i think that's so important because it it can be so easy for uh, you know for our society for white people in our society to say that's not my story or or I can't you know that's a, something I will never understand 
when you see, you know, an immigrant family who's going through this or this, you know, this coming of age and identity crisis that so many immigrant kids experience, it's very easy to say, well, that's not my story. But when you see it like this, uh, when you see a story of a family um, going through that same kind of crisis and some kind of identity, I mean, my hope is that it's something that will create greater empathy for those who, who watch it. Um, a lot of a lot of moments throughout this film, as I watched it, I kept thinking, what if this family was not white? What if this was happening to a person of color, to a father of color, to, um, you know, a, a family escaping the gangs in Central America? What if they were the ones going through this and what would it look like for them? Um, and there are similarities, but there's also dramatic differences. Um, and there is, yeah, that it's interesting to look at those points of connection and recognize the points of difference that privilege offers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, one of the, one of the points of connection there for me as well was that uh, in terms of picking this with the gospel passage again, was it in, uh, in the gospel of Mark, it says that Jesus, you know, was driven by the spirit into the wilderness. And to me, there's this real sense with Will, the father, that, again, he's been driven by a spirit as well. And like you said, that spirit of trauma that, um, that, keeps, that keeps driving him and keeps driving him on. And eventually, you know, at least as you're talking about here, that break that can happen between children and their parents and families and um, the way that ultimately she decides that she doesn't need to carry that same trauma or she can't, like Carl was saying, maybe she can't continue to be his comfort or his crutch that is needed. And she needs him to come meet her halfway or even quarter of the way, which I think is probably this, this last community where they land and he can't even make that. And the fact that in her own coming of age, she was able to differentiate in herself and to be able to name that for Will, he was organizing his life according to his PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and he was organizing it in a way that cared for him and cared for his daughter. And again, like you were talking about, was seeking was seeking a freedom, was seeking a way to be able to survive and to live. Um, and uh, and she she did not want to organize her life under that, and as a result of that anymore. Um, and thank you know she was in a place again where I think, like you mentioned, I think she was privileged to be able to be where the one place where that lived was in her whiteness, probably very readily accepted into this community more so than maybe you would have been otherwise, um, probably, <laughs> not maybe, <laughs> um, but that she was able to do that and that she was able to, to make that break. I feel like that's a, yeah, seeing, seeing that story play out. I know I've seen, I mean, I feel like I've even heard and seen that story from you and that break in um, uh, The Last Bridge Master or The Bridge Master's Daughter. Bridge Master's Daughter, yes. Bridge Master's Daughter. <laughs> Um, you know, in the story there of, you know, a a family that's up in the mountains that carries all these customs and traditions that have been long held and to see and to have parents, specifically the father in this case, wrestle through what it's meant that his sons especially have moved on or have left or chosen a different way of life. And, um, you know, that's one of the many themes that's in this movie that initially you watch and you think there's not a lot that happens here. <laughs> But the moment we start to sit down and talk and unpack it, and you're like, wow, there's so much in the unspoken. Yeah, so my favorite line from the movie was when Tom says, um, the thing that's wrong with you is not wrong with me. You know, it's, she's, she's because of Pat, her, I think her story, the arc of her story is her coming to realize that, you know, to differentiate and say, um, this person who I love, I'm beginning to recognize his illness and i'm beginning to recognize that it is not my illness you know <laughs> which at the beginning it was probably very hard to distinguish right because that illness is so wrapped up it's simply in a lifestyle it's expressed in terms of a way of living and so for her to be able to recognize that it's not her she has to to some degree be removed from that way of living she has to step out of that of that lifestyle um I want to talk for a moment about Dale Dickey, who is a woman who takes them in and seems to be kind of the matriarch of this trailer camp. Like, I think she owns the trailer. She rents them yeah. and she 
um, supports other people, but she seems to have created a community and a, a life in that place that is really not very capitalistic. Like she does not seem particularly interested in the rent that people can pay her. Um, and I, I don't know, the, the, this time around, I, I kind of found myself wondering whether any of this would be possible without her. Like there's that scene with the bees all um, connecting to each other and the bees are shown to Tom by somebody who's not the Dale Dickey character. And yet the woman who shows Tom the bees talks about the years that she's had to put in building the trust of these bees and what a great honor it is that these bees finally trust her. Um, and it could, it's, it could have been spoken by, by Dale Dickey's character, who is named Dale. Many, many of the actors in this movie, um, their names are also the names of the characters, but um so I, I don't want to like I. I want to say, and I don't, I don't know if I'm correct in this, but I want to say that um, part of the, what the movie is saying too is that we find our way to the ourselves through others, and for somebody like um, the father, who the character's name I keep rem- uh, forgetting, it's like the one <laughs> case where the actor is not actually giving his name to the character. It's not Ben. What is it, Judd? It's Bill. Bill. Yeah, there we go. Um, you know that that Bill is really trying to. Oh, sorry, it's Will. Oh, Will. Thank you. Uh, Will is really trying to escape himself. You know that that is what he's doing, and Tom is trying to find herself, and you cannot. The movie seems to say be saying you cannot find yourself without other people. Maybe without a community, maybe without a mentor, like Dale turns out to be for her. But that um, Will's project of trying to escape the world and himself will simply not succeed for his daughter because she has a completely different project. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really apt in that it takes uh, it takes people who are willing to do the work to build communities like that that can be welcoming, <laughs> that can operate out of generosity uh, instead of desire for profit. Um, you know, that, yeah, like you said, with the bees that look to build trust. I love how she, uh, Dale, to me also is that connective tissue mm-hmm. and that she, she knows and recognizes what the different gifts and skills of the people in her community are. And so she reaches out to the former medic, you know, and bring, brings him in to come and to help. And, you know, he's able to name right away that, uh, Will's character is going to want to get up and leave tomorrow, and he knows that. <laughs> you know, he can he knows in him and sees that the tortured soul um, that is dealing with so many issues. That I'm sure his colleagues from the military also dealt with, and you know, he's dealt with and needing to find his own way, needing to find this place to live, a comfort dog, all of these pieces that he's done to help to build a healthier life. And so, the way that Dale can connect to the right person for the moment and the right situation. Um, and that there can be that give and take within the community uh, is really is really something. Yeah, Dale's a fascinating character because although we, we know absolutely nothing <laughs> as far as <laughs> back, background, um, <laughs> well, first of all, the, the casting is just brilliant. I mean, her face is just so striking and you see you see this kindness and understanding there but you also see, I mean, she's not a soft person. She's someone who like, she has, I mean, her face is weathered yet somehow still kind and there's warmth, but there's so much strength. And there's something really remarkable when you can, when you can show so much about a character without revealing anything um, as far as like, you know, backstory or, or facts about her life. But one of the things that I just was struck by, like, I kept thinking she knows trauma. Yeah. She's been through some, some stuff. <laughs> she's, she's found healing and you don't find healing if there's not something to heal from. So she's, um, I don't know what her story is, but the way that she ties these people together and the way that she 
um, is able to offer healing to someone else tells you a lot about her and, um, and where she's been. Yeah, there's part of her mentorship of Tom is that she takes this bag out into the woods to leave for a, a another kind of lost in the woods veteran wild man. And she says, I haven't seen him for years. You know, it's been years and years, but I know he's still alive because he always takes the bag. And it is as if she and the others to return to our original theme of angels are kind of tending their angels tending to the the very fringes of the world you know they're keeping um a a demarcation uh there kind of on the borderlines between civilization and complete wilderness um but they're doing it with such understanding and gentleness that it's um it is it is like the early christian saints who went out into the desert in part so that they could by their very presence, tame the chaos of the wilderness. Um, so she's doing that a little bit, but but not in any kind of way that wants to privilege civilization, I feel. I was thinking even about um, the Old Testament idea of leaving the gleanings mm-hmm. on the edge and coming back to the story of, the, of immigrants. You know, in the Old Testament, you have this idea of leaving the gleanings, leaving the leftovers of your crop there on the edge for the immigrant, for the alien who is in your land, that they might have something to grab and to take. Um, You know, and in this case, they're not uh, growing crops up in the forest, but there's extra food that's being bought from the grocery and left out in this bag for those who are there on the edges or on the fringes, that they have something to come and to take and to survive by for those who are out in the wilderness. And finding finding that idea as well uh, being true. I have a question for you two. Looking at the parallels that we're we're drawing between the the scripture and this film, what is the temptation? Hmm. I don't. Well, you could I don't have an answer. I want you guys to tell me what's the temptation happening here. I think for me, there's one one area of temp. It feels like there is for for will. The temptation feels like it is to perhaps it is to give in and to become part of society. That that is a temptation that he would name um, as being something that's trying to draw him away. (laughs) Um, That that feels like it could be a temptation. I think a temptation could be to suicide or to take in his own life or to becoming destructive as well. And so he he's seeking to not give in to those temptations that could lead him down that path. Um, Maybe, maybe those are two ideas. Yeah. And and maybe for Tom, the temptation is to um, totally subvert her life to his needs, you know? So it's really kind of a temptation of love, but it is like, you know, we were to go to like Satan's tempting Christ, you know, it would be the, the temptation to say, here are all these people who need you who need you to take control and to rule and whatever. So allow their needs to define who you are. Um, And, and she resists it, but I, I would even want to stay. I don't know if it it could be stated as temptation per se, and it's probably saying too much to say it's the demonic, but even though every, as you started by alluding to Judd, even though we meet all these, good people throughout the film like there's not a single villain there is there is no one who is just kind of cruel for the sake of cruelty or dangerous for the sake of being dangerous but there is a sense of a kind of unseen unnamed everyday violence in our world and our culture you know uh, there there are at least three scenes where there are helicopters going by you know they're in the woods at the beginning outside of portland in the in the park and you hear a helicopter and he wakes up at night and then they go into Portland and they're on this tram going over the city and we see a helicopter flying by the tram. And then at the Christmas tree farm, there's helicopters picking up trees and delivering them. Every time it's a trigger to his PTSD, to his um, uh, experience of war. And it's a reminder to us that he is a victim of an of a incredibly violent world. Just and one the that bulldozers, we, the, bulldozers, the bulldozers in the forest taking out 
yeah. uh, taking out the camp for those who are homeless living there. Um, you know, there is, uh, yeah, there is a, an encroaching violence that's consistent on top of all of the scenes where you see they're being concerned about young women, especially mm -hmm. being taken away or trafficked or running away or that, that kind of is a theme through it as well. Yeah, I feel like, um, and, and I had a hard time seeing this as a temptation necessarily, but for sure the danger is that the whole, the whole journey towards freedom and independence has such a dangerous, violent, just possibility, shadow of possibility over it. I mean, particularly in, in the context, we're watching this in the early months of 2021, we've seen what that full just commitment to independence despite whatever else is happening around us complete irregulation saying no I, no one is going to touch my freedoms no one's going to regulate me or restrict me in any way i'm going to live my life i don't care what what anyone in authority says we've seen where that can lead and that danger it it's so it's such an interesting film because it it tells some, the story of someone who is seeking to be completely free and completely independent. But you see again and again that his violence is not directed towards anyone else. And that that's like named. And I mean, more than once that comes up, you know, people keep checking in with Tom to make sure that she is okay and that she is safe. And that this man who has been so traumatized by our violent society who has been used by our structures and our government in ways that have traumatized and deeply broken and injured him, that he is not lashing out at her and taking it out on, on her and those around him. And again and again, it's, it, it's confirmed that he's not, that's not who he is. His violence is not directed at those around him. But it's also, I feel like really important to recognize that that's I don't know if I want to say a rarity, but that is not the case in so many stories like this. Someone who has gone through what he has gone through, who is trying to kind of pursue this individualistic lifestyle, that it's not always a safe thing for the people in their lives. And I think the film does a good job of bringing that up again and again. Um, and that's just an important reality to recognize that we can't just throw off the shackles of society with no repercussions and with no danger to those around us or to the people that, you know, just come in our way. <laughs> so um, it's hard to, he is such a sympathetic character and we want him to be able to just live his life, but also those structures are there for a reason. Um, and there is violence in them. We see how, you know, the government and the military that he served used him and left him injured. But also we see these structures that are there, obviously, to fulfill a, a very needed purpose. We see the social worker who is doing everything she can to create a life that will work for them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, it, it's the tension of, of real life, right? There's it's just that back and forth that, like, how do you, how do you balance on that spider web, if you will, um, between the, the broader world we live in and our own independent, individualistic intimate relationships which is again what the film does visually <laughs> steps back and then it jumps zooms way close in um that's why yeah i think those those opening zoom those opening drone shots we get above the forest of them mm -hmm. where it's like you can only spy on them at the beginning right it's the only way that they're seen until then until then at the end yeah we're so up close and intimate yeah well, that seems like a great place to, to end. Um, so we have a question that we're going to give to our guests and ourselves every week during this, uh, this podcast series, which is, would you bring this film with you into the wilderness? So if you were not, you know, somebody who's running away from all technology and actually had a DVD player uh, in your backpack as you went trekking through the woods, uh, would this film be one of the DVDs that you had with you? Um, I'm going to say no. <laughs> Not because I don't like it, but because um, if I am in the wilderness, why do I need this film? 
<laughs> I think I think that this this film does such an amazing job of pulling you into that place and taking. I mean, it took me out of my living room into that wilderness um, in a way that I, you know, I obviously um, wouldn't wasn't experiencing before I turned it on. But if I'm out there in the wilderness, um, I'm already there. I don't know if that's. Uh, yeah. I, although if I'm out in the wilderness, why would I be watching a film? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if I were in the wilderness, there might be some yearning for a community or story or, uh, or, you know, other human contact, which might make me want to watch this film in particular. Um, but I think really if I was in the wilderness and I had been there too long, what I would be looking for is that trailer camp, you know, like I'd want to be sitting around the fire as the old people harmonize while singing, you know, be- you know, beautifully, I would want to be part of that community. And I think if I were part of that community, I would have less need um, for the kind of solitary entertainment of watching movies. So uh, I might say no too, but I, but then again, I might also say if I were in a desert and really wanted to look at incredibly beautiful, lush, you know, West coast rainforest, I'd be all over it. (laughs) I'd be like, let me feast my eyes. I think that uh, it's an interesting tension as well, because there is such in another reason for choosing this passage with the gospel is that idea of the belovedness of the father and, and the son and God and Jesus and this. And then we have this idea of like, there is a belovedness that is there. Um, You know, it's hemmed in by by the father's trauma right the extent to which he can offer it but it is directed uh and there is that there is that deep connection in somebody to go with (laughs) to a point until the break has to happen and then somebody else is provided in that that new community that comes about um so i think in that in that there's a vision of togetherness of care of love that is persistent and that fights um that fights for one another uh, I think I think it could still be a balm in the wilderness. All right. Well, um, Elisa, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thank you for thank you for the invitation. For the fil- yeah, yeah. Well, the, I think having a filmmaker, having somebody who is like thinking in terms of shots in a way that my mind usually doesn't go, has added so much, um, and having an activist has added so much. So so grateful you're here. Um, Thank you all for listening to Films in the Wilderness. Our theme music is provided by the great Brianna Kelly, and we are very, very grateful for the support of the Diocese of Southern Ohio, and especially for the work and support of Emma Steinmetz, Christopher Richardson, and Jason Odin. It was wonderful to see all of you, and listeners, we will resume next week with um, A Hidden Life, the Terrence Malick film.